If you're looking for plump lips that last, you need to know about Juvederm Lip Fillers. With Juvederm Volbella XC and Juvederm Ultra XC, your lip look, whether it's subtle or bold, can last up to one full year with optimal treatment and no additional maintenance. Find a licensed specialist and see if it's right for you at Juvederm.com today. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Add fullness to lips in adults over 21 with Juvederm Volbella XC or Juvederm Ultra XC. Do not use if you have severe allergies or a history of severe allergic reactions, or if you you're allergic to lidocaine or the proteins used in Juvederm. Tell your doctor if you have a history of scarring or taking medicines that decrease the body's immune response or that can prolong bleeding. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. As with all fillers, there's a rare risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. For full, important safety information, visit Juvederm.com. Flexibility is great. That's why there's yoga. Flexibility for your insurance coverage is great, too. That's why there's United Healthcare Insurance Plans. Underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, United Healthcare Insurance Plans offer flexible, budget-friendly coverage for medical, vision, dental, and more. One of these plans may be right for you if you're, say, between jobs, coming off your parents' plan, turning a side hustle into a full hustle, or even missed open enrollment. Want more flexibility? Find out more about United Healthcare Insurance Plans at UH1.com. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what Big Wireless does. They charge you a lot, we charge you a little. So naturally, when they announced they'd be raising their prices due to inflation, we decided to deflate our prices due to not hating you. That's right. We're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Hey, everyone. Today we have a very special episode with Walker Scobell. We'll be deep diving into the books and into the show, so stick around. But first, spoiler warning. If you haven't read Trials of Apollo, you're safe. But if you haven't read Heroes of Olympus or finished the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series, we will be talking about both of those series in this episode. Also, two quick notes. One, after this episode, we're going to be taking a quick break and then we'll be back with more interviews. And we will keep you updated on what the schedule is there on all of our social media. Also, please forgive the fact that we get something slightly wrong about a scene in the Titan's Curse in this episode. It ended up inspiring a really interesting conversation about Thalia, so it's worth it. Okay, that's all from me. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to Monster Donut, a literary and historical deep dive into the Percy Jackson series and all of its following spin-offs. I'm Emily, a classic scholar ish. And I'm Phoebe, a dramaturg and story consultant. And today we are joined by none other than Walker Scavell, Percy Jackson, in the Percy Jackson and the Olympians TV series. Hi Walker. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. First off, huge congrats on the season two renewal. Thank you so much. I know I can speak for both Phoebe and I that we are so, so thrilled with what you've done with Percy as a character. And we just cannot wait to see that continue to build throughout this season upcoming and hopefully many more. There's so many iconic scenes in Sea of Monsters too. So our first question is, which of those are you most looking forward to seeing adapted? I think the chariot races are going to be pretty cool Mm -hmm. um, because we haven't really done... I mean, we did capture the flag, but, like, we haven't really spent a lot of time in Camp Half-Blood. I was there for a second, then I was there at the end, but I was just kind of in and out, you know? So I think I think we'll probably spend a little bit more time on that next season, just looking at the book and all the chariot races and the fight on Half-Blood Hill with, like, the, the mechanical bulls and stuff. Mm, so that yeah. should be pretty fun. Can't wait to see uh, Annabeth and Percy working together, building building that chariot. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then Tyson at the end, yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I see you've got a shield behind you, too. Is that... <laughs> this is my Percy Jackson and, I guess, like, all movies shelf. I have that. I have the Capture the Flag shield right there. I have, that's the real metal Riptide. That right there, <laughs> the Sea of Monsters is missing from it right now. But if you can see the original covers yeah. right there. Yeah. Not the original, but, like, those are my first set of Percy Jackson books that I ever got. I still have them. Oh, um. man. <laughs> oh, that's so special. I always love having the books. They're at, like the first copy I read just in my hand. Yeah, my first copy of The Lightning Thief is literally just loose pages in a bag right now. <laughs> I've read it so many times. 
my mom's first copy because she i think she's reading at the same time i was while we were on set they have these giant pipes or not pipes like like fire hoses because if it's supposed to be like have just that rained or something they will like spray it down with all the fire hoses and stuff like the whole set and we were filming outside and there was a hole in the fire hose and it just sprayed directly into like the tent that we were staying in and it completely <laughs> soaked her purse and her book so it's like oh, really no. you know it fits though it yeah. makes it sense does. for that book <laughs> like this is my water damaged copy from percy jackson <laughs> yeah damage from percy jackson said water it's a pretty good mm-hmm. sword yeah you know what scene I am looking forward to in Sea of Monsters, um, or at least what I'm I'm curious what they'll do with it, the writer's room, is in the Circe scene right before Percy gets turned into a guinea pig, when she tempts oh, him yeah. to drink the potion. And he like sees his reflection. Yeah, because I feel like most stories like that, you know, you expect the hero to like maybe feel tempted, but you know, break through it or be stopped at the last minute. But like, no, Percy looks at the more confident version of himself and actually drinks from it. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I've always just found that scene fascinating. I'm so excited to see what they do with that. Honestly, me too. I, I keep like trying. To, I talk to Arian and like Leah about this all the time. We always like, they won't give us any of the episodes yet. I mean, I don't know if they're written, but um. So we keep trying to make our own. I mean, we're not writing them, but like <laughs> we sketch them out and like change some stuff for the show or or like guess what they might change later on. And so we have like all of the episodes and what we think is going to happen for all of them. I'll sketch out already. <laughs> so we're just waiting. Did you do that at all before season one? Um, I don't think so. I mean, it's like they don't really like to give out the scripts until they're like finished, you know, mm-hmm. until we like actually know what we're going to be saying. And, and then uh, they don't change anything because sometimes they like even like last second, they'll just take out scenes and add a big scene and just switch things out. And like it'll change the whole story. But um. I remember while we were filming, I used to go into the, because where the volume is and where we do our school in that office building, that's where all of like a bunch of writers are and and all the offices are. So I used to go in and talk to people and just like take a copy of an unfinished script and read it. (laughs) I don't know if this is a question you can answer. Was there anything you were like, oh man, I wish that had made the cut? (sighs) I don't think there was anything like that big. Actually, no, there was that one scene uh, that Aryan did. I oh, never yeah. got to see it. He showed me like a clip of it, but uh, it was a scene with like the Council of Cloven Elders, and uh, it looked amazing. It was on the volume stage. They had like a bunch of people dressed up as satyrs, bleeding and stuff. I never got to see it again. I saw a little clip of it, but it looked awesome. So I'm pretty mm. sad they removed that, but it's fine. We'll see them in the future. We will we'll see it eventually. And we'll get the extended cut too. I know. I hope <laughs> we get a uh, a blooper reel at some point. Because yeah, I know mm-hmm. there's a lot of a lot of bloopers. Were there any ones you remember that you're like, I really need that in my life, just as, on a video? Um. Well, I already posted one. I think there's two. There was one where it was a scene with Aryan, and he was getting dragged down into Tartarus, and I run and I jump and I land on him and I grab onto him. Uh, like right before that, they kept telling me like, make sure not to kick sand in his face. And so while we were rehearsing it, I didn't realize how easy it was to do that, and so I kicked sand in his face. <laughs> Oh, but um, no. the first like time I actually attempted to do that, like on camera, I sprinted and I jumped and I landed like right mm. on Aryan's head and I just rolled over him, <laughs> and he like sat up and like a bunch of sand came pouring out of his mouth. So I I really hope we get to see more of that someday. But um, yeah. Also, there's a scene the way beginning in the Minotaur fight where uh, I was ripping off the horn and I was stabbing it, and it was more of like a close up shot. I don't think they ended up using that shot, but uh. I was like exhausted. It was like the last shot of the day and it was pouring rain and everyone was cold. We were all ready to go home. I think it was like the last day of the Minotaur fight. And they put this snap thing in the horn and then they attached it to like the blue screen Minotaur. And uh, I actually had to snap it off. And on one take, I, I pulled it and I just like hit myself really hard <laughs> in the forehead. So I hope that we get to see that one too one day. <laughs> the mishaps of being a hero, you know? Yeah, a lot can go wrong. You know, something that uh, we've talked a bit about just while watching the show, um, but also we just talked about it with Daphne Olive um, from the writer's room in our last episode with her. Oh my god, yeah. I love her. She's his best. Yeah, we love Daphne. But something that we talked about with her was how complicated of a character Percy can be sometimes. Like, I remember when the casting call first went out for Percy. I found it so funny just how many character traits were listed for him. (laughs) Because it was like, well, he's quick to anger, he's impulsive, he's affectionate, he's smart, he's quick-witted. Like, it just went on and on and on. And 
I'm also, I'm just so impressed by your ability to capture every side of him because that's not at all an easy thing to play. I'd love to hear about actually stepping into Percy generally, but also were there any favorite aspects of Percy's personality that you really loved getting to dig into? Uh, first of all, thank you so much. That does, that means a lot, especially coming from like fans of the book. It, it's like, that's my favorite thing. I like to talk to people about that. If there's like, the other day I saw a kid walking in the hallway and she was holding like a Childs of Apollo book. Mm. And I said, I like your book. And then we talked about it for like two minutes. And it's just like the best. It's the best feeling ever. But um, I think what's interesting about Percy is that like he's kind of like double-edged, if that makes any sense. Like every trait that he has, he has another one that like directly goes against that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like he's, it's just, it's an interesting thing to play. That also plays into the ADHD part of him. And um, I think having Rick in the writer's room definitely helps with that a lot because like even just reading the script I know that like that's Percy and also just having read the book so many times I knew how I was gonna play him and and yeah you've definitely captured him thank you I just to like dig in to Percy a little bit further I want to touch on Percy's anger um, Mm -hmm. because I feel like that is a huge staple of his character in the books like that wrath that comes out um, if you push him the wrong way. And I, I totally see that, especially when he's confronting... Well, I mean, it's obvious in the, the Ares scene. Mm-hmm. But I was also, like, shocked, blown away by when he was talking to Zeus at the end of the season. Like, mm-hmm. he actually starts saying things that, like, no one has dared to ever say to Zeus, like, ever in the books. <laughs> very exciting. Very exciting to watch for me, personally. <laughs> it is. I love that part of him, personally. It's, like... It's, I mean, I see like TikTok videos about it all the time and stuff like that. It's just, it's funny to think about because the books are from his point of view. I mean, at least the first five. So you don't really think about how terrifying he must be to other people sometimes. Like I remember in like book four, when Rachel Elizabeth there drew that photo of him and he sees it in his dream Mm -hmm. of like him and like this like crazy look on his face. It's funny that like he just doesn't realize that he's doing that. You know what I mean? It's like subconscious. It's like there, you know? It's a part of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that moment. I I have drawn that moment myself. (laughs) I love that moment. (laughs) Me too. Yeah. I just, uh, I also hope he gets to do some of the Heroes of Olympus books because I think that would be awesome, especially because I think you get to see a little bit more of that too, especially in uh, Tartarus. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love those Tartarus scenes. Me too. I was talking to Arian about them the other day. So were we. We were just talking about them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You, I mean, they're amazing. I can't wait. I mean, I, I really hope we get... To, I never know what to say. You know what I mean? I, feel I know. Like, <laughs> I don't want to make it seem like I'm confirming stuff. Like, I talk as if I know what's going to happen, even though I don't. But if we do get to do Heroes of Olympus and stuff like that, uh, I always think about how fun it'll be to have Jason and all these other characters join the show. And even like next season, Tyson, I always think about like all the new castmates and like the new friends that we're going to make on set and stuff. It's going to be pretty awesome. I mean, I I can't wait to see Tyson. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. And Nico. Nico and, and Nico. Bianca. Yes. You know who I'm excited to see? Ethan Nakamura. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan Nakamura. All right. I like, I, I, uh, I always think about that scene on the bridge. When Annabeth, mm. when he, Annabeth jumps in front of him. So good. Him. <laughs> mm-hmm. That might be my favorite I scene know. in all of the books. I love that scene. I, I wonder what, I mean, if we get there, what we're going to do with that. You know what I mean? It's, it's stuff like that. Stuff like those scenes. I just wonder, you know, like, mm-hmm. how are we going to make that happen? Hmm. Well, I mean, you've got some very talented visual effects people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we do. Yeah. I personally would love to see Percy just single-handedly break a bridge. Oh, yeah. And doesn't he kill, like, 200 monsters beforehand? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sticks his sword in the ground at the bridge. Yeah. That, was, that was something I think we talked about going back to, like, how terrifying Percy is, where I was like, none of these kids know what just happened in the underworld. None of them know that Percy has the Curse of Achilles. They just saw him do that. <laughs> exactly. And I imagine, like, what kids were thinking... You know, because, I mean, demigods aren't that old. They're, like, what, 12 to, like, 17 or 18? Yeah. So, like, there's a bunch of 12-year-old kids watching Percy get, like, with a Hyperion fight, you know, when Mm. he gets, like, blasted back, like, 30 feet into, Mm -hmm. like, a concrete wall or whatever. Like, what, like, what do they think? They don't know that he has the Achilles curse. You know what I mean? Like, they don't, Uh he's just a normal dude to them. How did he get back up so easily? (laughs) That's one of my favorite parts of Heroes of Olympus is getting everyone else's Percy reactions just because it's sort of like those are the moments you start to realize like, oh, wait a minute. 
And you yeah. got that one with Jason, too, in Lost Hero, where, like, he kind of comes into his power and everyone's like, wait, who is this guy? Hold on. Yeah, it's, it's almost like you are the outsider watching, you know. Exactly. I wonder what that's going to be like. I don't know. I don't know why I'm so... It's, like, weird. I haven't talked about Percy Jackson in, like, six months, you know? Like, I haven't <laughs> really talked about Percy Jackson in so long. It's, like, I, I keep... My mind keeps getting flooded with things to say. And when I'm halfway through, like, saying one thing, I think of another thing that's also awesome. I'm just, I, I mean, a lot of the time, I'm interviewed as, like, like what we've done. You know, they don't really ask me what we're going to do, you know? Mm. Like, they, they, they talk about the past. They don't talk about what's going to happen in the future. And so it's such an like, interesting thing to think about, mm. you know? Um, well, we will, do, we will be asking plenty more questions <laughs> about the future. <laughs> um, but I am curious... You know, it, just generally, it, since we don't have the narration in the show, um, like we do mm -hmm. in the book, and Percy's narration is such a like massive part of the series, as a book fan, as a book reader, since you've read it so many times, do you have Percy's voice in your head like while you're playing out some oh, of these yeah. scenes? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, sometimes I'll go back and, like the Tunnel of Love stuff and, and all those scenes, I'll go back and just read what he's thinking about that, you know, and just think about that while I'm mm -hmm. doing the scene, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I kind of like that they don't have the narration. I think it works for the show. I don't know. It'd be cool if we did a season where I'm like narrating the whole time, like you, like Joe Goldberg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really close to the microphone. It's like that the alternate cut of Blade Runner, right? Where they had one where Harrison <laughs> Ford narrated the whole thing and one where they cut it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know they did that. <laughs> I think was, they were originally going to have a narration, I think, for the whole sh for the whole movie. And I think I remember reading Harrison Ford was like, no, I feel like it's a better movie if we just show everything instead of having him explain it. Yeah, I, I mean, I like the fact that there isn't narration in the show. Like, I like that you just mm -hmm. kind of intro, intro it at the beginning and then the do, do the little, like, reverse on the intro at the end. I, did, I like the intro to the show, though. The, yes. the narration <laughs> there. I hope we do that for every season. And like the end of every season. Oh, oh be yeah, because cool. I mean, the start of every Percy Jackson book is so iconic. It is. They are, yeah. And also, it's such a good way to like. I mean, it's it's great for the book fans and it's great for the non-book fans. You know, the narration because it kind of gets all of the exposition like out of the way. You know what I mean? It gets everything that's happened in between seasons. Mm. Like it kind of explains it all. And also, like as a book reader, I love the narration at the beginning because I think mm. it's like. I don't know. I just feel like Percy Jackson when I'm doing it, you know? It's mm -hmm. cool. That's interesting as well, because I feel like that makes sense to me, since I think in the books it's pretty well established that, like, at some point, Percy's writing this as his story. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. I, I mean, it's always, like, implied that he's, it's like a Percy from the future, but he talks in, in like, present tense, you know? But yeah, maybe, maybe like, at the end of the, of his new Percy Jackson series, or Rick's new series, mm. maybe it'll end with, like, him, like, putting a pencil down and, and finishing it. And like the whole thing was just a story. Mm. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, I think he does He does mention in uh, Charles of the Gods, he says like, uh, he made a typo or something. I was like, a typo? You're typing this? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the whole thing's a college essay for Charles of the Gods. Oh, oh. Ah, there you go. <laughs> See, that's great. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, something else that we've seen a lot um, as book fans uh, coming into the series is um, a lot of sort of small changes to a lot of the events of the show, even some like little moments here and there. Uh, there's a few that we cannot stop thinking about, a huge one being the sword fight between Percy and Luke in episode eight. But we were wondering if you had a favorite change that you, when you were first reading the scripts, maybe you were like, oh, this is good. Huh. Um... Sometimes it's hard to remember what's mm. the show and what's the book. Yeah, It's hard to like separate that because like you're reading one thing and then you like film another thing. But um, I think back to that Luke thing, I kind of liked how they added the fight. I mean, the scorpion thing was cool, mm. but I just, I think it's like, it's so much cooler that Luke tries to like recruit him and that's going to mess with Percy, I think, you know? Mm. Yeah. Which will make it even harder for him because I mean, at least in the show, I know it's like a mixed topic for the books, but I don't think that Percy and Luke aren't friends. I think they are friends. They have a lot in common. And uh, I think the hardest part about Luke betraying him was that, like, Percy believes him. You know, he agrees with him. Uh -huh. And uh, I think, like, as we go throughout the seasons, it's going to be harder and harder for Percy to not 
join his side, you know? Mm. Right, like the longer you're kind of used by the gods, the more you're like, exactly. this guy has a point. Like, <laughs> like exactly. I think all the time about in Heroes of Olympus, that one moment in um, Mark of Athena where he's like, Bacchus shows up and is just watching them fight instead of helping them. And he's like, I totally understand where Luke was coming from, actually. Like, he has that thought. I need to reread Heroes of Olympus. I feel like I remember all the big parts, but I do not. I, I don't know. I, it's been a while since I read them. You just reminded me. I need to reread them soon. <laughs> I, I mean, a lot happens in those books. There's, there's a lot in there. Those, those, are, a those lot. are some big boys. <laughs> no, I didn't remember that happened until we just reread it recently. And I was like, wait. <laughs> yeah. And also, I mean, again, for the future, I wonder what they're going to do with, like, Camp Jupiter. Mm, you know? Yeah. S-P-U-R. That's going to be weird. I don't uh-huh. know. I feel like, I mean, it's going to be cool. And also, like, the ultimate personalities of the gods. Mm. That's going to be sick. Yeah. So much stuff down the road. You know, one small change that is a favorite of mine was in episode three, when Grover and Annabeth are both asking Percy what he's so afraid of, and Percy finally admits that he's afraid that one of them is going to put, going to betray him and that he like feels totally alone. I loved that because we we had talked about, like, I I didn't realize until we reread the books for the podcast that Percy really doesn't share how he's feeling with the people around him very often. He <laughs> he's very interior. Yeah. And so just seeing Grover yeah. kind of bring that out of him was really, really nice. It is. It's If you think about, like, the books, I mean, if you think about how much dialogue there actually is between, like, Percy and everyone else and, like, sharing his feelings and stuff, it's all, like, internal. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, which is amazing, but it's just, it's weird to think about, you know? Like, when you're changing it to a show. Yeah. Yeah. It's why I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, we were just telling Arian the other day too that I can't wait to see what they do with the empathy link yeah I'm excited for that too I was thinking about that because like from then on Grover knows what Percy's feeling all the time I know because he decides to leave it right Mm mm-hmm yeah I didn't think about that I don't know I uh I I have some information on the books like about like what they're gonna do but it's so like I have a little bit about like what's gonna happen and stuff and I keep wanting to say it but I can't (laughs) Sorry, if I'm giving like dry answers, but no, I, I keep we'll thinking s- about the new stuff. We'll sit and wonder. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was also a question we got on Twitter that was kind of related to this um, conversation, which was, were there any moments in the show that made you rethink your interpretation of a scene or a character or just made you see a part of the books differently? I mean, definitely that betrayal with Luke at mm. the end. Uh, that really made me rethink some stuff. Uh, but also... There's a scene where I was like, oh, I definitely got it right. Like, I got my interpretation of the character is perfect. <laughs> uh, it was when, at the end, the very end of episode eight, where I'm talking to Chiron and Mr. D shows up, and he gets my name wrong again. But as he's walking away, there's this kid on the bench, like, packing his stuff up. And me and Glenn were supposed to just, like, stare at each other for the scene. And, but uh, Jason started, like, improv and he walked over, and he started, like, screaming at the kid, like, what are you still doing here? you need to go, you need to get out of here, and like screaming at him. And so we just started laughing, uh, which I hope, that's another blooper I hope they show, but um, I was like, they got Dionysus perfect. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they definitely did. Yeah, it was so funny how human the gods felt in the TV show to me. Like, I feel like they kind of almost ramp it up too. I feel like, there's a couple moments with Ares, but I felt like Hermes was the first one where I was like, oh, right, these are gods, sort of as a viewer watching, where Mm -hmm. you kind of think about how powerful these characters actually are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, I remember we had this giant, like, not, I mean, kind of table read on the first day that Lance and Toby showed up, and we just, like, sat down and and just talked about all of them for, like, an hour before we started working, and just talked about the different, like, parts of gods and how they operate, and uh, it's interesting. I like that. I like the way that they're written. They're very human Mm -hmm. in the way that they're, they all have a large ego, is what Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. which is very human-like, I think. Which is interesting, like, considering this version of Poseidon, I think. It's more of an internal thing, you know? Because mm-hmm. every time you think of Poseidon from mythology, he's always killing somebody or, like, flipping boats and, and killing people in the ocean. Yeah. But you don't get that, like, vibe from this one. It's more mm-hmm. of, like, I don't know, it's like an ancient power or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's cool. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I feel like the show has spent some time kind of showing the, the dichotomy between humans and gods in that, like, or at least between Percy and Annabeth and Grover and the gods, because you have 
you know, the three of them together, they have like empathy, compassion, willingness to sacrifice mm -hmm. for the people you love. While over and over we hear in the Olympian family that the like the betrayal going after glory and power and the, that's the way the family is. But then there's also these characters who kind of are between them, like Hephaestus and, you know, like we get some of the gods mm -hmm. who act more, you know, human in that way. And we also get like Luke, who's a little bit too much like his family. Yeah. Um, and so I've I've been enjoying watching the way that that human and God relationship has been built. Me too. Yeah. So um, we have one more question that we actually have from our Patreon. Shout out to Mason. We basically want to start getting even deep, uh, talking a little bit more about the books after this. But I thought he had a great question, which was, were there any moments uh, during maybe the casting process or the shooting process where you really felt like the chemistry between you and um, Leah and Arian, or just like any other of the actors really bursting through and really felt like, yeah, this is this is it. I think it was that scene in Camp Half-Blood in the Capture the Flag fight with Clarice, with mm. like Dior, <laughs> that was, I mean, I've said this before, but I was, I was really scared. That was, I wasn't <laughs> acting there. That was terrifying. But yeah, it just felt like, as I was doing that, I was like, oh, so this is, this is what it's like. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, for Percy, you know, mm. it just felt so real. I wasn't thinking about like acting. I was just thinking about, I hope she doesn't kill me or something like that. <laughs> that uh, we saw the capture the flag clip at Comic Con, and that was oh, the yeah? clip. That was my favorite of the three we saw by far because it just felt so cool to see it all, like everything, like in the world at Camp Half Blood, really come together. And I loved mm. how funny it was, but also how great the action was, and just felt like. The perfect, like, yeah, that's Percy Jackson. You did it. Um, also, the scene with the lizard. So good. <laughs> oh, the lizard. They had a real, like, lizard wrangler and everything. They brought, like, a huge one in and then a little one. Um, oh. I don't know if I would have done the scene if they had the huge one. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. And also, like, the peeing scene. Oh, my God. And the flossing. <laughs> How much of that came from you and how much of that uh, was it just sort of like, all right, what would Percy do <laughs> sitting in the woods? Um, or was that more of a choreographed situation? So it was kind of written out. I mean, the flossing part was literally written in the script <laughs> to do. And as I was reading, I was like, really? I mean, I came out. It, it, it works. You know what I mean? I like it. It works for the character. But as I was reading it, I was like, this is coming out in 2024. You know? <laughs> But uh, no, I think it works perfectly. I think it fits in perfectly. He would do that, which is so funny. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think you really made it work because it was it was just great that whole sequence. Thank you. Okay, shall we shall we talk books? Let's do it. Um, yeah, because we heard uh, so Daphne Olive recently guested on the newest Olympian podcast, and she mentioned that apparently you would ask a lot of people working on the show uh, to rank the Percy Jackson books. I did. I did ask people that a lot. It's weird. It was so long ago. I don't remember things. No, I, I think it's great. You gotta, you gotta see where people are at. You know, you have to figure out like what they're a fan of. Um, so as they're answering it right, like what, what are sort of the things you learn about them? Like, like take us through the process of you know, <laughs> analyzing their responses. Well, I remember Leah said four, mm. and I like four. I love four. It's it's one of my favorites. But I mean, my favorite's five. It's just it's the best I think uh and also it's hard to rank these books I think they're all like perfect in their own way you know mm -hmm. but uh my personal favorite's five but I was I mean I I didn't ask her but I was like she she definitely just wants to do those like Rachel Elizabeth there mm. like, <laughs> their, their beef I think that's gonna be pretty funny yeah yeah um, but <laughs> I mean who else Aryan said five too and yeah that's come on five is just like the coolest book ever, I think. I have to tell you, five is like third on the list for me. What? Oh. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I'm not mad. I'm just. <laughs> I was gonna offer myself up as a guinea pig too. I, my favorite's four. I think there's something about that book where every scene is just banger, nonstop. You know, it all just works really well. I can understand that. I can totally understand that. What's your second favorite? It, it's Titan's Curse. I love that book. This is how my ranking goes: five. Three, four, mm. one, and two. So why why Titan's Curse over Battle of the Labyrinth for you? It just it feels so like adult. You know what I mean? I don't want to compare it to like the Harry Potter books, but the, you know, like the switch between Chamber of Secrets to Prisoner of Azkaban. Mm. 
mm. like the at least movie wise, mm-hmm. I feel like it's that kind of like shift in vibe. Mm. You yeah. know, it's like it's the winter. Like the stakes are the highest for Percy at least because Annabeth is gone, which I think is like you know it's definitely a lot more important than the other quests are to Percy. Actually, it's kind of tied with with one getting his mom back. That's important too. But um, yeah, it's just it feels so like fresh and it's just like different and new and and everyone feels older. Yeah. yeah, we talked a lot about that when we analyzed the Titans Curse, the tone shift because it's mm-hmm. just. I, you can feel them getting older. I think also because Nico shows up and he's, you know, so much and younger, younger than them. Yeah. And Percy's like, oh, that reminds me of me when I was your age. Like, especially Capture the Flag and stuff. Yeah. And I love the kind of, like, the end betrayal is almost like a reverse of, like, basically what happened to Percy at the end of The Lightning Thief. But Percy's in the Luke role in that, like, Nico feels like he's being betrayed by this older mm-hmm. character. I just, you can feel them getting older because they're playing new roles in the story. That's a good way to put it. And also kids are dying. Kids are dying yeah, around kids. them for the first time. Beyonce <laughs> gets crushed to death, basically. Mm-hmm. Or no, electric <laughs> to death, that's worse. Right. Zoe Nightshade gets basically punched to death by her dad. Yeah. <laughs> also with a dragon poison. And also, like that final, that's going to be so awesome to do, like lifting up the, uh, the sky. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, the hole in the sky. In the sky. Oh right. And also they're the the gray streaks are you ready to dye your hair gray for <laughs> several years <laughs> i am i am ready to do that but yeah i mean again it's like and also four four also has that same kind of effect especially at the end of four mm-hmm. the end of four is like because i mean in titan's curse people die throughout it but with four nobody really die. i mean pan dies but like he doesn't really die he just kind of mm-hmm. moves on mm-hmm. it's just something about the switch from like that like kind of fun adventure. I mean, it's not fun. Again, it's like risky. People might die, but then coming out to Camp Half Blood and like watching their home get like destroyed and watching their friends just like get skewered and die like right off the bat, it's just like terrifying, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that sets it up perfectly for five in the beginning and and Charles Beckendorf dying. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like an immediate. This is what this book is about to be. Like scrap it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, did you have any, like, from the books, thinking about the books, any favorite plot lines or character arcs that you enjoy following through all of them? I mean, Nico's obviously a big one. Uh, mm. He's, like, one of my favorite characters. I think Daedalus is going to be awesome. Mm. And, uh, that's cool. I wonder what actor they're going to pick to play Daedalus. Such an interesting character. Who else? There's so many people. Zoe Nightshade, Thalia. Thalia. I'm so curious to see what they do with Thalia, especially next I'm season. I'm curious, too. Yeah, I hope it's like part of me wants to be selfish and like try to get all my friends to cast <laughs> like, <laughs> Momo and, and everyone to get them all on the show. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm just I'm curious to see how like their characters are going to work out with the story and stuff. And I kind of like how season three, it's almost like Thalia and Percy are kind of fighting for like who's next up after Annabeth. <laughs> It's like they're fighting over who's the main character. Like <laughs> they're fighting over like who Annabeth picks. Yeah. Mm. Or who gets to have Annabeth, I guess. And Dahlia showing up, it's just such an interesting like thing to put on Percy for that season. Mm. It's just it kinda like Percy's working his way up the like, food chain, uh, at Camp Path Blood, like from one and two and, and then he gets like near the top and then Dahlia shows up and immediately like bumps him way back down. Mm. You know, and I think that's going to be interesting to shoot. And like mm-hmm. that scene where she does like the snap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, she's like, oh, Chiron didn't teach you that. <laughs> and he's like, wait, am I like, are you are you more important than me? Everyone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially because like she never actually made it to get like she's been there for, you know, a couple months at this this point, And Chiron has already told her that. All of this stuff. And also, like, I keep thinking of I know it sounds weird, but like banter like back and forth and stuff. I keep thinking of a bunch of like tree puns I could use <laughs> on her and stuff like that, like the pine cone line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Doesn't he call her like pine cone face or something in the book? He does. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the, the isn't that in the scene? Maybe it's not, but I I love that one scene where they're fighting during Capture the Flag. Mm. Yeah, that, oh, I, I always think about that. It's such a good moment. And it's it just shows Percy's fatal flaw. I think that scene especially, mm. like loyalty to the person, I think that's like 
that's that's his fatal flaw right athena says that it's personal loyalty like uh that you would mm. destroy the world to save a friend um nah. is what she yeah. says but i can't remember if in that scene that's what sparks like it what's not what he remember he because she's about to get beaten by the huntress and he goes and saves her is that what happens I don't, I'm pretty I don't sure. know. let's search this up actually i'm gonna be embarrassed if i don't get this right yeah, no, I think you're right. I think he's, like, going to save Thalia, and then she gets really mad at him for, like, he, stepping in. He left his in. post, and they win. Oh. Yeah. And that just shows, like, the difference between them, you know? Percy's willing to lose if he can save someone, mm-hmm. and uh, she's not willing to do that. And I think mm-hmm. that shows the difference between Poseidon and Zeus in the books, I guess. I mean, I guess it doesn't really show them, but through their kids, it shows their differences, I guess. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. Yeah, no, totally. Do we ever in the books learn what Thalia's fatal flaw is? I was just thinking about that. I don't I don't think we do. What do we think it is? I don't know. Getting turned into a pine tree, maybe? <laughs> that might be one. <laughs> what is a fatal flaw? Let's what if we had to make a fatal flaw? Now nah, I'm the interviewer. If you had to make Thalia have a fatal flaw, <laughs> which fatal flaw would you make her have? Hmm. I'm thinking about so in our one of our uh, conversations with Daphne Olive, she talked about how fatal flaws to her are like your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. Which I really like as an approach. Mm-hmm. I 100% agree with that. What do we think Thalia's greatest strength is, Phoebe? Um, we've seen what got her killed already, so her fatal flaw should be in that scene. Yeah, like willing to sacrifice your life for people that you love, maybe? I'm gonna throw yeah. something out there. Yeah. I'm gonna go with, like, like, independence almost. Like, she really wants to, like, be a, her own person and, like, only rely, like, self-reliance, basically. Hmm. That's a good one. I could see, and not wanting to join the join the hunters. Yeah, but I feel like she sort of she joins as a lieutenant, right? Like she doesn't join to be a, a part of a group. She joins to like get You're her, right. uh, you know, re- regain control, right, of her fate instead of being the prophecy. Yeah, kid. she's she always has to be in control. Mm-hmm. Mm. Or maybe maybe she has the same fatal flaw as Percy. I mean, yeah, because Annabeth says that like Percy and Thalia are so alike. That like she doesn't know if they would kill each other or if they would be best, best friends. Best friends. Mm-hmm. That's I. I mean, that's gonna be interesting to film too. I hope mm-hmm. that like we do some scenes where we're just like best friends, and then some where we're like hate each other. I don't know. Just like mm-hmm. a, a good mix, a good even mix. Mm. Yeah, there's that one very small scene in the Titans Curse the that I love. The car. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I was mm-hmm. gonna say. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love seeing them just like bond for a second and then by the end of the scene Thalia being like get out of my car <laughs> that's gonna be pretty funny to film and also apollo apollo's in that book yeah, yeah apollo is in that book i'm excited to see who they cast for him yeah i mentioned sam claff uh sam claflin mm. hopefully that happens mm-hmm. that's a good choice i saw like a fan cast that one time and i was like that's perfect yeah i i kind of think of him as more of like a ken you know what i mean like, <laughs> yeah and i i think of like artemis more like uh if this makes any sense, they kind of have the same dynamic that Percy and Thalia have mm-hmm. in a way that like they're similar, but and and Apollo doesn't care, but I think Artemis hates it, so that might be interesting. And I'm I'm just like I hope that he's like a Ken. If they get Ryan Gosling, that'd be great. But um, <laughs> uh-huh. I can imagine him just like doing haikus and stuff. Mm-hmm. I really like that though, the like Artemis Apollo dynamic being like the Percy Thalia dynamic. Mm-hmm. I like that yeah. a lot of the like, we're, we love each other, we're kind of the same person, but also we, there's just something in there that just makes us clash that we cannot get around. It just mm-hmm. doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I really like that. While we're talking about the books, I do want to talk a little bit about Heroes of Olympus, um, even though you said mm-hmm. that you maybe don't remember it very well. <laughs> I remember a good bunch, though. Okay. I'm ready. I think I heard that you were rereading them at some point. Are you rereading them? I am rereading them. Uh, but I taken, I've taken i taken a quick detour. I'm rereading Sea of Monsters now. Makes sense. I am, I'm on Lost Hero. I'm on Lost Hero. Which I, I keep thinking about. It's going to be, if we do it, it's going to be so weird because I'm not, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. in it. I know, I don't want to sound like full of myself, but, like, that's just such a weird thought. You know? Yeah. You'll be, you'll, you'll be felt, though. You'll be missed, I'm sure. I hope so. <laughs> I hope people will miss me. <laughs> I feel like Percy sort of hangs over that whole... Kind of like the way Thalia hangs over Lightning Thief. Like, Percy kind of hangs over mm-hmm. that whole book where it's like, where is he? Yeah. And none of the characters know who he is, so he is kind of like a ghost in the way that Thalia is. That's true. Mm-hmm. I never thought about it like mm-hmm. that. But not even, like... I mean, it's, it's different because the main people on the quest, like, 
at least with 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 like Annabeth and Thalia, Annabeth knows she was on the quest and like Annabeth was best friends with Thalia. She knows all about her, but like Percy's this random dude yeah. that none of them know, and they get to this like random camp half blood world, and they're apparently they're demigods, mm-hmm. and they have to go on this big quest, and it's just it's kind of funny. It's funny how things repeat themselves. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's just like the way it works, and every time the characters find a way to kind of like break themselves out of it in some type of way you know yeah. yeah that's something we talk about a lot it's how it's interesting how like they're repeating myths in a way but then they're also sort of by the time you hit heroes of olympus especially it's like they're the myths and then they're kind of mm-hmm. like uh, they're, they're sort of like finding all the other ways to kind of play out those same stories which i think is a really interesting part of that series yeah have you read the short stories i don't think so they're short stories uh, it's the demigod files and the demigod diaries. oh i read demigod uh yeah. diaries Okay. So I must have read the short stories. Because in the Demigod Diaries, there's that one short story where they're like on what used to be the battlefield in like Battle of the Labyrinth. And they they just like, it's almost a legend at this point. Like they keep hearing stories about, oh, you don't want to go over here because that's, you know, where something happened. <laughs> it's like and cursed. Yeah. It's cool to see the stories that happened in the first series turn into myths in a way. Mm-hmm. Since we are coming up on time, one last question for you so at the end of each of our episodes we like to design whatever book or episode that we just watched um at the end of the summer a bead like they do at camp half flood oh that's sick so if the bead for season one of percy jackson and the olympians couldn't be a trident what would you put on it to symbolize this season and it doesn't have to be a symbol of like the full journey or the full season if you want it can also be just a symbol of like a moment or a story that really stood out to you that's a good question. Maybe a Minotaur in underpants? Yeah. Or um, maybe just like, I know this is like weird, but maybe a gold bead, just like a, a, like a shiny gold bead for mm. Ares' blood. Mm. Mm. Okay, yeah. I thought mm. you were going to say like gold-ish, like bronze on one side and then like oh, the steel oh, on like, the like, other. Oh, like steel, bronze, and steel. <laughs> like backfighter. I don't know. That's a good question. That's a really good. You guys have had such good questions, by the way. <laughs> I have Thank you. That. <laughs> the the winged shoes, maybe. Yeah, mm. that's a good one. Yeah, I think I actually picked backbiter for mine. You did pick backbiter. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I love uh, all the different metals and the lore. That's the other thing I kind of do is I'd like to keep track of it and just be like, all right, how is this all working together? Like. It's kind of a scary thought to think about, mm-hmm. like with backbiter, mm-hmm. like. Mm-hmm. It's half celestial bronze to kill monsters and half steel to kill yeah. humans. Yeah, I was like, that's a weird. When I was watching it in the in the show, I was like, no wonder they didn't have him explain it in this scene because you lose <laughs> all sympathy as soon as you're like, I also made this sword to kill people. <laughs> yeah, that was a little bit a little bit terrifying in the books. Um, yeah, like it definitely works in the books, but yeah. When I when I first read the book, I remember that was the moment when I I think when I first read it when I was like twelve or thirteen that was the moment I was like, oh wait a minute that was my first that was the moment I was like uh oh I think Luke oh no <laughs> I think Luke might be a bad guy that sounds I think Luke might be a bad guy <laughs> he might be a villain uh, maybe <laughs> that scene in Titans Curse when he he uses the sword he uses Riptide and it goes right through a bunch of mortals I think that's when he meets Rachel Elizabeth Day right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and she sees it. Yeah, and I always think about that, and then I think about Backbiter's existence, and I'm like, wow. Wild that it's he made weird. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, real quickly, I was just going to say, like, at school, it's weird because we were just talking about the Hoover Dam today, and I always, like, I can't stop thinking about, I don't know, it's just, every time I hear, and I love how, like, it kind of takes place, like, the Percy Jackson books, we're in, like, different kind of, like, national monuments, in every book, at least like one different one. I mean, technically, season two with uh, Bermuda Triangle. And again, I'm taking this class in my school called Harry Potter. Oh. And what we do is we uh, go over, like we read all the books and we watch the movies. And a lot of what we talk about is the hero's quest and like mm. the trio and all that kind of stuff. And so it's weird to like <laughs> talk about that, you know? Yeah, you're just sitting there thinking about Percy Jackson instead. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting because those are, I mean, I feel like Percy Jackson and Harry Potter, those are sort of like our hero's journeys. Those are our like huge touchstones that we think of now. Like even like, mm-hmm. you know, because Phoebe and I, we're a bit older than you, but we still like, these are the books we grew up with. This is sort of like, you know, th- this is what we think about when we think about Greek mythology. Like you talk to most people now and they're like, oh, I, I don't know that much about Greek mythology, but I read Percy Jackson. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I used to think I was a Greek mythology expert. Uh, when I was really little, we took a trip. It was like for a couple days, and we went on this giant vacation, and we went to the Louvre in France. Oh which wow! I, I would appreciate that a lot more now, I think. <laughs> um, but then I was just kind of pissed off that we were going to France to go to a museum. <laughs> but as soon as I heard there was a Greek mythology se- like section, I immediately started like trying to tell everyone like which mm. statues were who and which person was who. Uh, they look a lot different than how they're described in, in Percy Jackson and stuff. <laughs> That's kind of the cool thing, though. You sort of, it's, it's cool that you can, like, recognize them still. Like, you can look at a statue mm-hmm. and be like, oh, that's Dionysus. So I guess I'll ask one last fun question, just because now I'm curious. Do you have any go-to uh, Percy Jackson trivia questions you ask people? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I mean, I haven't really had, like, a completely in-depth conversation about Percy Jackson with a lot of people. But, um, I mean, normally if someone says they're, like, a fan, I always just ask them what their favorite book is and talk about their favorite book. But uh, I guess my go-to question would be something like, what does Nico feed the dead? Or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Someone random like that. Or, or the second year, or the, the, the first year, what was the camp beat? Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. What's you guys'? Is- it depends on like how hard I want to make it. But one of my favorite things, and I'll stick with like Sea of Monsters maybe, but mine would be, what language does Cersei sing in? Mm. Ancient Greek? No, it's actually not ancient Greek. What is it? I'm interested now. It's Minoan, which is the language of the Cretan people they had before the people we know of as the ancient Greeks came in. I've never heard that. I mean, I've probably read it at some point. Is it like said in the books? Well, it's sort of like uh, Percy's narrating and he's like, she was singing in some language that sounded like Greek but wasn't. Minoan maybe? And I was like, Percy, you recognize Minoan? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> of course he's a smart kid <laughs> yeah yes son of sally jackson yeah. yeah sally jackson also learned minoan i think that's got to be canon now that's that's canon mm-hmm. yeah one thing i hope that we do get at some point is talking ancient greek i think that'd be pretty cool yeah getting a, a scene like uh poseidon and zeus had mm-hmm. yeah those are fun for me because i actually took greek in college so i was sort of like Ooh. you took greek in college it's awesome yeah, that is unfortunately Rick Riordan's fault. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> the heck, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really great. It's it's a really cool language. I would highly recommend it if you ever get the chance. It's really fun to read stuff in the original language. That that sounds... I know Patros. Yes, you do. <laughs> That's it. That's my ancient Greek. Don't we, all, don't we also know, like, eat my pants or whatever person oh, yeah. Eat my short? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's, um, eres kakoros or something is what any of us says, like, uh, eat crow or something? Oh, yeah. To get, I don't know. There's, like, random ones. That was, like, the, <laughs> dude, every time I hear something, I'm, like, or from Percy Jackson, or even if it's, like, a little sentence, that it, like, sounds kind of familiar, and I know it's from Percy Jackson, I, like, can't stop thinking about I'm going to think about that all day what book that's from because i know exactly what you're talking about is that clarice did she say that to did she say that to clarice who maybe it is i don't know we'll just have to reread them again oh well oh well oh well (laughs) well we are at time so thank you so much for joining us walker this was a great time thank you so much for having me i'm sorry i couldn't give two in-depth uh responses today We'll just have to have you back after season two comes out, and then this is where we can get into it. (laughs) I'll be back. Thank you all for listening to Monster Donut. Thank you, Walker, for joining us. Um, If you want to get a sneak peek to who we may or may not be interviewing and also submit um, questions for those people, you can always sign up for our Patreon uh, where you'll get access to um, some of that information ahead of time. Also, our episodes ahead of time, uh, a bunch of other bonus episodes and content and much, much more as we continue. With that said, thank you to our patrons, RK, Winda Wells, Emily Ann Bonnie. Roman Consul, Latino Kaya, Patty VCK, Bethany from Public Works, Sydney Fox, Joke, 
Reina Avila Ramirez Ariano, Charlie McNeil, Bronte Lebo, Chief and Plays, Robert Gamer, Kels, Kari, Leila Hussein, Mason Bowman, Casey Cassidy, Evelyn Zamudio, Kelsey Young, Busy Cat, Nikki Feldbaum, Abby Gray, and Melanie Valdez. Thank you all very much. If you want to find the links to our Patreon or any other information about us, you can find us at PJOPod on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, you'll also find um, on our Instagram and Twitter our link tree that will take you to um, all of our social media and um, also our merch shop where you can pick up some uh, great shirts designed by Phoebe. Um, you can also find Phoebe's art there, and it's great. 10 out of 10 would recommend. <laughs> also, if you want to give us a rating or review, that also really helps us out, and we love to hear any feedback you might have about the show. You can also respond on Spotify to specific episodes. Um, you can also leave your wrap-up questions at um, any of those social medias. You can add us or DM us or respond on Spotify, or you can email us at monsterdonutpodcast at gmail.com. Is that it? I think that's it. Do you have a bead for these interviews, Phoebe? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> My bead is the little Zoom recording icon. <laughs> and when you press it, there's like, they've built into the bead the voice of the lady saying that Zoom is now recording. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> The terrifying voice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>